Are you ready to become awesomer? Hello, everyone. My name is Umar Hamid. I'm your host on the No Limit Selling Podcast, where industry leaders share their tips, strategy, and advice on how you can become better, stronger, faster. Just before we get started, I've got a question for you. Do you have a negative voice inside your head? We all do, right? I'm going to help you remove that voice in under 30 days guaranteed. Not only remove it, but transform it. So instead of the voice that sabotages you, there's one that propels you to much higher levels of performance and success. There's a link in the show notes. Click on it to find out more. All right, let's get started. Hello, everyone. Today, I have the privilege of having Martin Root here with me today. He's the president of Livelihood. Martin, welcome to the program. Thank you. A pleasure to be with you, Omar. So, Martin, why don't you give us like a one-minute uh, bio? Yeah. Who are uh, you? Who, <laughs> I'm uh, born and raised in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, So, and uh, dual citizen, Canadian-American. Um, I'm a management consultant. That's been most of my career. I've worked with large companies like uh, Sony Pictures, Southern California Edison, Virgin Records. Uh, I've spoken four times at the Harvard Business School on Vision. I'm co-author of Chicken Soup for the Soul at Work with sales. I think last I looked at over 1.1 million in 26 wow. languages. Yeah, it's amazing. Uh, and now this newest book, Project Heaven on Earth. We're going to talk about that in a minute, but uh, you very much have a deep understanding of human behavior and why we do what we do. Uh, deep, <laughs> but not complete. <laughs> no, I'm still uh, no surprised. One ever yeah. So right now, we're at a crossroads where all around the world, people are getting entrenched into me first, my group first, my tribe first, my tribe is better than your tribe. Any thoughts on, like if it was happening in one country, you kind of go, hmm, that's interesting. But when it's happening globally, what do you think is going on right now? I've been thinking a lot about that, Umar. And it's, it's a question that concerns me very deeply. I think we have developed I as far as it can go. And it's now going into some, some kind of dark territory. And that what needs to emerge now is we, not to the exclusion of I, but we needs to come out. Look at the problems, the major problems in the world. COVID, that is a pandemic globally. The environment, that is an issue globally. Uh, the threat of nuclear war, that is, God forbid, a, a, you know, a threat nu- uh, globally. So these are problems that have the potential to wipe out all of us. They're ex- human existential problems. I can't do this. We needs to do this in conjunction with I, but we need to develop we so that we can solve problems. That's what I see yeah. going on. You know what I like better? Uh, we's nice, but there's something more warmer about us. I, You know, that's a lovely thought. I never thought of that. Us. Yeah, I like that. I never thought of it. What's the difference? Let me ask you, what's the difference between we and us? Well, uh, we is we is the subject. Us is the object. Yeah, uh, we the people, uh, as in the U.S., you know, yeah. uh, are important documents. Uh, us is uh, just seems warmer to me, and maybe that's my peculiarity. I had never but, thought of that. I like it. There is that warmer tone to it, for sure. One of the things I've been thinking for a while is that we have been – this is my theory, which has zero scientific data behind it. So bear with me here. That I suspect when we went from hunter gatherers to farmers, that there was a major, major shift with a lot of people saying, Are you nuts? Why would we stay in one place? Why would we do this? That's not who we are. And then we went from agricultural to industrial, industrial to technology. And let's say technology to the information age. I don't think we're quite in it yet. I think we're at the cusp of it. And anytime we went from one state to another, there was a lot of fear that, you know, our world's going to end, our kids going to be okay, what's going to happen? And I think the reason there's so much uh, nationalism and fright is because we haven't fully stepped into the information age. There's uncertainty there. And what I was thinking was, you know, with this political strife that what we needed was the Martians to attack us. And if the Martians attacked us, we would come together. And then I realized that that was a fallacy that... COVID is here globally, and we're not coming together. We're still more deeply entrenched than we were in the past. And uh, kind of thoughts on that? Yeah, Omar, um, let us suppose, I want to give you an analogy here. Let's, you're, I see you in the room, I'm assuming it's your office. Let me say that I asked you to leave that office and go into the next room. 
Yes. And let me say that the doorway between the room you're in and the next room is now has been widened magically overnight so that when you're in the doorway, you are completely enclosed in that door. Your whole body is within the doorway. In transition. It's called the liminal period. Comes mm-hmm. from the Greek, from the Latin lim, limnus, meaning doorway. We are not in the previous room, and we're not in the next room. We're in a space in between. So our frame of reference is still the previous room. Although, actually, I think we've maybe taken a step or two into the new room, but we have no bearing on it yet. And so that causes great uncertainty. Pair that with these existential, uh, the three crises that I talked about: economic, mm-hmm. uh, environment, uh, and so on. Um, so, not that we ever had certainty. I mean, ever life is not certain in that sense, but there was a myth of, of some kind of certainty and stability. Delusion, which is very useful. It was a delusion that was useful, very w- wisely said. Um, and so what I've been looking at is, given that that's not present, where's the source, the spiritual source, the stability? Certainly it's family, it's friends, it's connecting with people who are wise, who have loving intent, Um, you know, we decided this year not to go back, for example, to the United States. We're staying in Prince Edward Island, Canada. There's a sense of decency here. It's safe. COVID is very, very low. Um, and you can't get in. I mean, (laughs) the borders are locked. Uh, so that's giving me a, 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 uh, you know, a safe and I think a very privileged and, and beneficial place to look from. We're going through a transition. We're in a liminal period. And once you know that, I had a, a career counselor, a friend of mine years ago, who gave me a book. I've forgotten the title, but it was written by a psychiatrist who spoke about the liminal period. Interesting. And I was in a liminal space myself at the time. Reading the book, it was like, this guy is in my head. And uh, it was great. Brilliant. So let's talk about your new project, because I think it ties in nicely to kind of how do we bring people together? Well, the new project is called Project Heaven on Earth. <clears throat> and it came really... Umar, out of my desire, uh, I said that a lot of my work had been has been in vision, build, uh, building visions with individuals and with uh, corporate groups. And I thought one day, is there a vision for the world? And um, this thought came to me, well, if because I was working in, in business, and I thought, mm-hmm. if, if we can transform business, we could transform the world. And then this thought popped in my head, oh, you mean heaven on earth. And my first reaction was, oh, my God, you can't say that, you know, and I, people will think you're proselytizing, you're, you're, you're uh, you know, you have a hidden agenda, a hidden religious agenda, none of which was true. But so I, I withdrew. But then I thought, but wait a minute, I can speak to you about hell on earth. That's a permissible conversation. Oh, absolutely. Why can't I talk to you about heaven on earth? Why can't I talk to you about the kind of life and work and nation and world that my soul deeply longs for? And why can't that be public conversation, permissible conversation? Not to impose it on anybody, no, but to evoke it from people. And that began the the inquiry. Brilliant. We're going to go there in a minute, but let's take a step back. And the step back is this, is that hell on earth is a phrase that we can all relate to. Yep. But heaven on earth has religious overtones, but one can't happen without the other. So why do you think we have permissibility for the negative aspect of the same side of the same coin? It's kind of curious, isn't it? Because I totally agree with you that there's two different rules. It's a, it's, it's a wonderful question. Part of creating heaven on earth is to clean up the hells on earth. It's not just some la di da stuff, and we'll get more deeply into it in a moment, but it really is confronting the hunger, the war, that you know, the deep suffering. Um, I saw a young woman who the book is dedicated to and when I was at an orphanage in Brazil, and she had been burned, cigarette burned. She was catatonic. I never have seen anything like that in my life. I, I reached out to try to just even touch her hand, and she recoiled. And I, I tried to give her a little doggy, you know, a little stuffed doggy. No. And then I just... In my mind, that's the only thing I had left. I said, look, I apologize for this. I'm sorry that this happened to you. And she stuck in my mind. And I thought, screw this. You know, this is not acceptable, period. It is not. It really made me mad. It's unnecessary. You know, I actually had the thought, God forbid, I could have killed the parent or parents that did this to her. I was so mad. Yeah, it is astounding the cruelty that we have. The only people that are inhumane are humans. 
<laughs> yes. So, so that gets that gets you know. So we need to clean that crap up in a, and talk about the good stuff that we can do as well to create more heaven on earth experiences. For example, this you know this interview with you, we just met online, and uh, you know I was taken with you. I was taken the previous interview I heard, and in my interview with you by the pre interview, I thought there's something here. This guy's interesting. You know, you've got a, a good heart, you've got a warm heart, and you've got a good business background. I want more of that in the world. Brilliant. Uh, so I'm going to do a transition on heaven on earth in a minute, but to do that, we need a joke. So let me give you a joke. <laughs> so sometimes I mess around with people and I was uh, driving with a friend and I said, I can prove that God exists. And yes. he goes, prove it to me. As we're driving by, I've slowed down to 25 miles per hour because there's a speed camera that has given me many tickets. And I said, only Satan could have invented the speed camera. And if Satan exists, then God has to. <laughs> But let's talk about heaven on earth. So what's really interesting is this. My illusion is that when when you ask people, what does heaven on earth look like, that nobody instantly goes, well, it looks like these five things. I, I would suspect for most people, there's some introspection to really go, huh, and then they articulate what they're thinking. Is that a true statement or do people have it at the top of their head ready to go? Well, let me go deeper with you. So when I when this thought came to me, it's about heaven on earth, and I decided to begin an inquiry into that. The way I do inquiry is I'm not a big reader. I'm an interactor. So mm -hmm. I went, Umar, and asked, I don't know, 100, 200 people, what's heaven on earth? What's heaven on earth? What's heaven on earth? And I began to see the lay of the land asking this question. And then what happened was I distilled three very powerful questions that get right at it instantly. And with your permission, I'd like to ask you them, and I'd like to ask your listeners to answer them as we go through as well. Brilliant. Okay, let's I'm do take that. a sip of water yeah. and go for it. So question number one, <clears throat> recall a time when you experienced heaven on earth. Recall a time when you experienced heaven on earth. What was going on? So you asked me for this question before, and what's interesting is another memory is bubbling up. It was just in the room, uh, we were talking about the transition between rooms. Just down the hall is my bedroom, and it was a particular challenging time for my wife and I in our relationship, and we had made love, and we were just there together, uh, one human to another, and that would be heaven on earth. It wasn't the lovemaking, it was the connection. Yeah. Like everything else had just totally disappeared. It was yes. one human being connecting with another. Lovely, lovely. All right, second question. Here's a magic wand, and with it, you can have heaven on earth. What's heaven on earth? People doing one kind thing a day for someone, someone they know, someone they don't know, without agenda. Just the sheer joy of doing it. Very clear. And then the third question what simple, easy, concrete step will you take in the next 24 hours to have more of that, to move that forward? To follow the advice of uh, step number two is to do one kind thing for a stranger. And I've been doing that. And uh, two days ago, uh, I met this woman uh, for the podcast, and she is transitioning from working for someone and doing something herself. So yesterday, I invited her to my uh, Facebook group. And we did an interview about how to get anybody on the phone that you want. That's her business. It was a way of sharing her wisdom and getting her highlighted. And that was my one kind thing yesterday. Lovely. Lovely. So let's go through the questions one by one. Question one, recall a time when you experienced heaven on earth, what was going on? What you did, Umar, is you answered the question, being connected with my wife after we made love. What you did not do and what no one does is ask Martin, what do you mean by heaven on earth? Yep. How do you know what I'm talking about? I never defined it, but you go right to it. People go right to it. It's because they have what I call an already knowing in their soul. And when I say recall a time you experience heaven on earth, bang, the time when I, and then they answer the question. That was astounding to me when I first discovered, made that discovery mm -hmm. that people know. The second question, here's a magic wand, and with it, you can have heaven on earth. What's heaven on earth for you? The purpose of the magic wand is to remove the necessity of having to know how you're going to do it. And if you don't have to know how, you go right to the what. And for you, it's very clear. It's living a value. The value is doing one kind act for somebody you know or don't know. Now, there are other gateways, which I'll talk about in a moment. Your gateway is living a global value. 
And then the third thing is, I'll do that every day. And you gave me the example of doing it with a woman a couple of days ago. So you notice we, we move from, oh, yeah, I, have, I do know what heaven on earth is. I've had mm-hmm. the experience to, I do know what it is, to here's what I'm going to do to get going. And when you jump to a higher level, Umar, by people answering that, those three questions, we're changing the story of what it means to be a human and what it means to be humanity. We're co-creating the new story. To go back to our analogy previously, we're naming the new room that we're entering. Yeah. So let me uh, take that a little bit uh, deeper, perhaps. So when people go through that exercise, there is a certain level of reliving of the event that they're talking about. This is what heaven on earth is. Yes. And oftentimes in workshops, I'll ask people, what comes first? A thought or the feeling? So do you have a happy thought that makes you feel happy? Or were you feeling happy and that generated happy thoughts? And people have different answers. And I, the answer I give them is, which always gets a laugh, I have no idea. But they happen so closely together, it doesn't make a difference. Correct. But I think your exercise, what it does is it gets people to reaccess that moment yep. of heaven on earth so they actually get that feeling. And we'll do more for feelings than we'll do for thoughts. So I like that. I think there's more to kind of ground people to that emotion because that's that energy and motion is what will get inspire them to take action to do something. Hopefully, which would be the the third thing. What are you going to do today to make that happen? What uh, the language is very important. What's simple, easy, concrete, brilliant, simple. And that's genius, by the way. I know it's not mine. Uh, it came from a, a dear, dear friend of mine, Mark McCurgo. Simple is. It, it, I'm getting more and more about the notion of simple. There was a there is a woman in Austria, Elizabeth, and uh, we were talking about heaven on earth. What's your heaven on earth project? And she said Austria is a heaven on earth nation. And I went, what? How could you <laughs> even say? And she said, well, Martin, it's because it's simple. And she taught me the meaning of simple. I don't know what your simple is, but you know what it is. And when you find it, you'll do it because, by definition, it's simple for you to do. And once you do it, you're in. And you're in to co-creating heaven on earth. So just to add to that, uh, what's kind of interesting is uh, sometimes it'll be like, uh, so Martin, tell me, you know, the the five things you really need to have in working with a client. And let's say you come up with the five. And then I go, uh, is there anything else? And you say, no. Then I go, uh, when you look at the list, what's missing? And oftentimes an answer pops up. So by asking the question, what's a simple thing, you're opening up a filter in their mind that as she goes for the simple solution, which is almost always the best. Yes. Had you not had that simple thing in there, well, the first thing we need to do is to get the United Nations to da 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 and all of a sudden this complexity. So good on you, mate. And, and thank you, mate. And they're also, then they become overwhelmed. Yes. I don't want you to be overwhelmed because overwhelm is an act of arrogance. If I'm overwhelmed, it's about me only. And meanwhile, the sufferings are going on in the world. So let me also just tell you about the other gateways. Your gateway was living a global value. For some people, it's inner. The more heaven on earth within me, the more it will show up in the world. For some, it's about relationship. I have a bad relation with you know, Bill Smith. It's a hell on earth relationship. I got to go clean that up and make it heaven on earth. Ending a suffering, war, poverty, hunger. There usually is for people, if, if it's ending a suffering, there's one suffering, which I call the keystone suffering. It's the one that really rings their bell. Making an institution work making your country a heaven on earth country. And the final one is this here right now, this is heaven on earth. And our belief that it's not is what's keeping us away from the realization. Brilliant. Martin, thank you so much for an amazing conversation. We need to schedule another one. So we're going to put links to your books and your website. Thank you. Thank you. Can I give you, actually, can I give you a couple more examples? Oh, absolutely. I think the examples are, are, so a woman in Hawaii has put, her definition of heaven on earth, she's embedded it at the end of every email. Done. Um, a police officer has written a 16-page manual called Heaven on Earth for Law Enforcement. A real estate agent has <clears throat> created a program called A Home for Everyone. Each agent in her office donates $100 off of every commission check. They raise up to a maximum of twelve hundred a year. They've raised four hundred thousand wow. dollars for this program, a home for everyone. 
a woman who was committed to ending violence in her community started a program Omar called Making Change, in which they handed out a little mason jar with a picture of a woman, half her face beaten up, bruised, half her face bright and alive. And they asked for a penny a day. That's all, a penny a day for a year. They raised $2,500 from two communities. They took that to the federal government. This was in Canada, who gave them a hundred grand for each of the subsequent three years. We go all the way up to the country, Austria, and we have a man from Gabon in Africa living in Montreal, Canada now, who has a Facebook group, get this, called Africa, a heaven on earth continent. He wants his continent to be heaven on earth. It blew me away. So the creativity that emerges from this is staggering. Um, so yes. And inspiring. Totally inspiring. Because the creativity just... I, I, that's what gives me so much juice c- to keep doing these all these years. The creativity astounds me. So, Martin, do you have that manual from the police officer? I do. Send it to me, please. I will. I will. I will. Brilliant. Martin, thank you so much for being on the program. Oh, I really pleasure. appreciate what you're doing. And, and my uh, book, I get a little plug for my book, Project Heaven on Earth. Project Heaven on Earth on Amazon, available globally. And the three questions are available on projectheavenonearth.com. Brilliant. Thank you. Thanks so much, Martin. Thank you, Omar. If you enjoyed this episode, please go to iTunes and leave a five-star rating. And if you're looking for more tools, go to my website at nolimitselling.com. I've got a free mind training course there that's going to teach you some insights from the world of neuro-linguistic programming, and that is the fastest way to get better results. 